This is Judge Joe Brown, and we're listening to We All Be News. News Free Dixie for the 21st century. Okay. Well, you know, as, as we were speaking earlier uh, about uh, the University of Kansas, known as KU, uh, I was there, went mm -hmm. there as 17 years old, going on 18, and um, I'd be w really walking up to uh, the men's dormitory, Templin, and I can't not remember the women's dormitory, but anyway, there was this beautiful, uh, beautiful African American woman from uh, she's from Oklahoma City, and uh, I had to really in, uh, increase my stride to keep up with her because she was walking fast, but she was friendly and she would talk to me like, and we'd just be walking and stuff. And so every time I would see her, I would, if I had to run to catch up with her, get so I could talk to her, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so she told me, she says, I'm coming to your hometown. This is 1960 for Christmas. I said, oh, wow, we have got to get together. Must. I was so happy jumping up and down. So I gave her my telephone number. And true enough, uh, during those Christmas holidays, she called me, and I was so excited because I just knew she and I were going to get together. We could go places, go to a restaurant. So one of the first things that came out of her mouth is, uh, would you like to speak to Marion? Mm -hmm. I said, Marion? Marion who? She said, Marion Barry. I said, uh, she said, that's who I'm, I came to see. I'm, I'm, you know, losing altitude. I'm saying, I, I, I wanted to see you. She said, you want to talk to Marion? So she turned me over to Marion. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize who this later on was to become, Marion Barry. Later on, I also found out that he had spent a year at the University of Kansas. That's how he managed to run into another, to her. Mm -hmm. This is in and out of those SNCC days, and in Memphis, I think he had gone to Lemoyne and different things. So uh, that always struck me, Marion Barry. Uh, you know, I had a reason to kind of have a somewhat of a dislike for, for him <laughs> because I sure wanted to talk to Carol Kidd. And the amazing thing is that when I would see Marion in public, I would go up to him and I said, Marion, uh, why do you act as if you do not know me? He would look. He said, should I know you? I said, yes. He said, why? I said, Memphis. He said, Memphis. I said, yeah, I get closer to him. I say, Carol, kid. He said, where's she at? <laughs> is she here? Is she here? I said, no, she's not here. He says, when is the last time you saw her? Several, on several occasions, Marion stopped everything he was doing. And each time he talked to me for over an hour, wow. he would flag his bodyguards off. You know, they'd come up and he'd say no. That he was interested in talking to me. On one occasion, say I was playing in this large mm -hmm. uh, orchestra, this jazz big band. And as I'm talking to Marion, I hear the band cranking up. <laughs> and I said, Darren, I'm supposed to be on the bandstand. But I'm talking to Marion. And through those talks, Ron, I gained a deeper respect for this guy. Before I thought, People just made a lot of stuff up mm -hmm. about his having connections and respect for, for the elderly. I said, well, you know, that's just political. He's faking. Then they said, well, you know, he, he, he was concerned about the young people mm -hmm. and the children. 
I kept thinking, ah, that's just political. Marion was serious about black folks. When Marion took over, he, in the estimation of many people, created the so-called black middle class in Washington, D.C. And they never could get him on stealing a dime. He never stole a dime. He was serious. He was serious about the community. And people are always bad-mouthing him. So the more I got to know him, I knew that he cared about the people and I knew he was not a womanizer. Mm -hmm. And when they first came out with this thing of Rashida Moore, mm -hmm. I said, I got to get a good look at this person, see who this was. And I said, well, wow, she is interesting looking good at calling Miss Molly. But in thinking about this, I had to analyze a lot of things. And this is what I invite everybody else to do. Mm -hmm. It's so easy to take the word of the media and people who think that they're spokesmen in the media who can uh, stain and destroy somebody's reputation. In the case of Rashida Moore, he knew her. He helped her. Rashida and some friend of hers came to him and said, we have a business plan. Mm. Well, he's the mayor of, a, of the city of D.C. And he says, well, what is your plan? They presented it to him. He says, well, that's great. And he says, I'll do what I can to help them start up their little business and apparently mm. it was successful and it worked and so forth and so on. But it would be easy for people to mock, well, he's just a womanizer. When the sting took place at the, what, what hotel was that? I can't remember, in D.C. Okay. Where the government spent over $40 million to tell us what we already know. Marion not only loved people, he loved women. He wasn't a womanizer. See, that's the thing mm -hmm. that we get confused about. Mm -hmm. But I kept thinking about it because some people had mixed emotions. Because they couldn't understand what they were seeing on those videos. I almost had the name of the hotel. Mm -hmm. Is it the Vista? Something like the Vista. Wasn't it the Vista Hotel? Yeah. In D.C. And I should. I don't think it exists now. Okay. But anyway, they had this big hoopla about it. What was interesting to me is this. The government says that for Marion to get along and to like women means he was an adulterer and a criminal. Okay. Morally and ethically, we should question that, number one. And then we want to say he was a criminal. But guess what the FBI revealed about themselves? The FBI, and people used to ask me, how did you get that? How did you know that? The FBI went all the way to Los Angeles and got Rashida Moore. Because they knew that he liked Rashida and not too many, many other people. Why didn't they just get the average woman in D.C.? Mm. They couldn't trust it. Marion Barry wasn't going to stop doing whatever he's doing to come see just anybody. The FBI went and, and, and in a sense, I guess, terrorized and intimidated this woman. Mm -hmm. Told her that they were going to take her children from her if she wasn't a part of this staying operation. So when she came, they brought her. They flew her to D.C. Now, did they fly the drugs to D.C.? Because it was their drugs. It wasn't Rashida Moore's drugs. And by the way, folks, for those that are listening, it's supposed to be against the law for anybody to have drugs, including the government. <laughs> what is the government <laughs> doing with dr the drugs, dispensing drugs? Mm -hmm. So she calls him up. And she says, hi. And he says, hi. He says, where are you? She says, I'm in town. He says, where? Marion stopped doing everything he was doing 
to go see Ras Shida. When he gets to the hotel, as soon as the door opens, an arm sticks out and it says, have some of this. And he pushes it aside. It's all this on tape. Mm -hmm. And she says, come on, have some of this. He says, no, I don't want that. I didn't come here for that. I came here for you. You see a way? Yes. It's my little yeah, listening yeah, audience because, seeing. Yeah, yeah. Because my government is always trying to triangulate something against black men and do some strange stuff. But mm -hmm. they did it on Marion. Three or four times, they kept pushing this, take a hit on this. And Marion Barry said, okay, yeah, boom. As soon as he took a hit on that, after saying no three or four times, mm -hmm. then they come in and arrest him for taking drugs. These were not his drugs. Hello. Oh. Then they didn't know what crime to try to ch charge him with. He's smoking some drugs that are not his. He did not want these drugs. He wanted to spend, if they're still listening, <laughs> quality time with Rashi. But the story doesn't end there. Hmm. People were telling me, oh my God, ain't that something? Rashida Moore and all of this kind of stuff. I said, you all need to examine this rather closely. First of all, Marion Barry is very loyal to people that he knows and he cares about. And that's what they were counting on. So when they began to create this case against him, they had to keep Rashida in D.C. Hmm. To justify the FBI and the government's involvement in this, they had to get these little FBI agents to watch Rashida 24 hours a day. They had to go to the bathroom with her. Wow. Now, I hope my, your listeners are not fainting and going, Oh, my God, isn't this terrible? The terrible thing about this is what our government did, <laughs> their behavior. The terrible thing was not about Rashida and not about Mary and Barry. I had to sort through this without the help of people who might have had more knowledge than I. <clears throat> Sometimes I think I'm only of average intelligence. But I had to put my mind to work. I had to say, wait a minute. Then somebody says, I said, by the way, if any of you ever find Rashida's number, kind of <laughs> pass it on to me. They said, why would you want her number? I said, if Rashida could make Mary Berry stop doing anything, <laughs> my God, she could. I said, anyway, now for some, that's neither here nor there. But truth be told. So follow this thing again with the FBI. So if the FBI had to watch her every move, so they had to get dramatic. They said, now nah, this is a high profile case, crime of the century. Marion uh, Barry is taking drugs, which really means distributing drugs. He wasn't distributing drugs. <laughs> it wasn't his drugs. Good thing he didn't die. Right. Suppose he had died from the drugs, would the government take responsibility for their drugs? Or would they blame it on Rashida? Or would they say, well, it was Marion's drugs or whatever? I thought about this, Ron, really deeply. And then I said, well, you know, the FBI is in trouble. And people said, well, you can't say the FBI is in trouble. I said, yes, they are. They said, no, they're not. We fought. No, yes, they are. No, they're not. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay. I bet you it wasn't a week later they made another trip to Los Angeles and found Rashida's boyfriend or somebody and flew him. Wow. In other words, they had to get a boyfriend from Rashida to keep the wives of the FBI guys because the wives said, well, hell, if she can make Mary Barry stop doing anything he was doing, good Golly, my little FBI husband don't stand a chance. Don't stand a chance. And, and they got to go to the bathroom with her. 
They got to watch her every move. The poor wives in the FBI was going, I know they was having a fit. They said, oh my God, they was praying day and night. <laughs> Lord, help us. But see, they don't think about these things initially. They only think about these things as it's unfolding. How can we present ourselves as family values? Mm -hmm. Remember? Mm -hmm. See, when you go along crooked, and remember the FBI and Jay Hoover and all that cross-dressing stuff, all this stuff, and spying and lying on Martin King, being involved perhaps in the death of Malcolm and the Kennedys and so forth and so on. They're there, and they can't say they don't know it. And if they weren't in it, mm -hmm. as even Uncle Jesse would say, <laughs> <laughs> if they were in it, that's bad. Mm -hmm. If they weren't in it, that's very bad. <laughs> well, then who did this? And what does it mean? And it's funny, the irony, they gave, uh, had a big trial, Mary Barry wound up spending a few months in Lawton or somewhere, and the people re-elected him twice. <laughs> they really got pissed off, damn. Mm. <laughs> Haven't we discredited him? Be Remember, they tried to discredit, discredit Martin Luther King mm -hmm. by lying. Again, using women, trying to say Martin Luther King had before we killed him. They, well, they wouldn't say we killed him, but right. before he was killed, he had sexual relationships with them, And they had the number up there, which, which was assigned me. They really lying. <laughs> See, <laughs> had they just kind of said that you know, uh, he might have been with several people. No, they had to exaggerate. Wow. <laughs> and they exaggerated big time, which let me know, you really wanted to discredit Martin Luther King. You didn't just give him a hard time and cause his death, but then to lie on him huh. and say that he was this huge, big adulterer, and this, that, and the other. And this is something that it seems to me is a part of their repertoire, their, 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 their bag of tricks to discredit and to disconnect us from our community with all these lies. But we have to be f forever vigilant Take the news, but you got to look at it and examine it. Any of the news. It could be anything. It could, it could be uh, Muammar Gaddafi is out to kill Reagan. Mm -hmm. They interviewed Muammar Gaddafi. He said, I, I, is it true you want to kill Reagan? <laughs> he said, no, and he was laughing. He was dressed all up in his fancy little right. uniforms and things. Mm -hmm. He had to remind people, I'm of a country, what, what do they have, 8 million people, if that? He said, no, I'm not trying to kill him. He said, but I think there's some Americans who are. <laughs> and as it turned out, was his Hinckley, John Hinckley, right. of uh, Jody Foster fame, mm -hmm. he, he did try to, <laughs> try to kill Ray Gone. Mm -hmm. But you see, we buy into stuff. Reagan got on the television and told us that Muammar Gaddafi of a country of, let's say, 8 million people, I'd have to check it now to see whether that figure's even close. Mm -hmm. Reagan is in charge of the Air Force, the Navy, the Marines, the nuclear weapons, the CIA, the NSA, the local police, mm -hmm. the National Guard. Why tell me somebody's trying to kill you? <laughs> The Mafia would never do that. Did you know that? Mm. The, the Mafia gangsters who fall out with each other and have spats and stuff like that, and they want to kill each other, they never get on the television calling the police talking about, uh, uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. our boys is after us. And, and well, what do, you, what do you expect me to do? I don't even have a pea shooter. Right. I'm in the nonviolent, Resistance mm -hmm. Peace Organization. I'm with Martin Luther King. Nonviolent. 
organizing to bring peace and justice. And Reagan is on that television telling, telling the American people somebody's after him. Of course, this is before John Hinckley mm -hmm. carried on. But all of this kind of stuff is amazing. And this is some of what my education uh, is. And it's funny how, uh, I'm trying, I don't forget his name, the congressman uh, Conyers. Mm -hmm. You know, he's a big jazz fan. Yeah. And he used to come down to the one step down in Saint, in uh, Washington, D.C., where I played. Uh, I played Saturday uh, afternoons and Sunday afternoons. And he, right shortly after Hinckley had cut up and done whatever, uh, made an attempt, uh, he was telling people that the way he thought that thing came about is that the Secret Service is always harassing the wrong people. And I heard that there were black people like just going about their daily business mm -hmm. as they normally do, just walking around. Mm -hmm. At the same time that the event was going on, they were saying to black people, you can't come down the street. And they said, well, why not? what's going on? Black people, what's going on? They said, Reagan is coming and we're going to clear the street. You look suspicious. Everybody black is suspicious. <laughs> and when, when John Conyers was telling everybody, there was about three or four white folks there and most of the rest of them black. He said that Reagan, the way Reagan almost got killed was because of racism. People said, well, Hinckley wasn't black. Hinckley was able to get that close to him because he was white. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and people say, well, oh, really? Had Hinckley been black, Hinckley wouldn't have been nowhere near. Because four blocks away, anybody black walking, even, oh, I love my baby. <laughs> and they say, helicopters and stuff like that. They say, assume the condition. You got to lay down on the ground and say, what's going on? So you can get up now. So what happened? Reagan's car just went by. <laughs> but everybody black got to assume the condition, get on your knees, mm -hmm. throw your hands up, lay against the wall, just the whole thing. And so Kanye's, and then I went and told everybody I knew. Mm -hmm. Their racism almost got Reagan killed. This guy was able with a trench coat. No identification. He went all through the press. Did you know that? Blonde haired, blue eyed John Hinckley. Mm -hmm. Because they're not looking for him. <laughs> Guess who they're looking for? They're looking for black folks that look suspicious. Mm -hmm. That we're the ones that want to kill Reagan. Now, we weren't the ones. John Hinckley <laughs> was the one. And this kind of stuff plays out all the time. And so we have to, to me, reclaim and begin to understand we can't follow the, me the media. Look at the stupid stuff they did to Mike Tyson. And we put up with that nonsense and endorsed it. I did and I have two daughters. You know, what kind of games are we playing? And then make Mike Tyson the poster boy for date rape. Hmm. Mike Tyson didn't have a mother or a father. Cuss the Amada's sister. Hmm. Help. Care for Mike Tyson. Can you imagine that cuss? Mm. And do you know who cuss was in relationship to boxing? Did he like train Muhammad Ali to help train Muhammad Ali? Floyd Patterson. Oh, Floyd Patterson. Okay. Yeah. You okay? Mm hmm. Guess who the. We're going to let that ice maker. Guess who she taught how to sing? She was a vocalist, a vocal trainer. Barbara Streisand. Mm-mm. Oh. <laughs> uh, it was a black singer or a white singer? A black singer and an athlete. He was a high jumper. Uh, uh, oh, I about always going to say Carl Lewis, but he can't say. <laughs> <laughs> 
You uh, just run fast. Bob, too. Bob Moses. Mm -mm. No, wait, Bob. Wait a minute, that's wrong, Moses. I don't know. I give up. Johnny Mathis. Oh, really? Cuss wow. the Amato's sister. Wow. Trained Johnny Mathis, and this is the same person that was like a mother to Mike Tyson. Wow. See, we need to really understand something and do some reading and do some analysis. Mm -hmm. And I don't let people criticize Mike Tyson. Mm -hmm. Because there are people who have mothers and fathers and they don't accomplish nothing. <laughs> yeah, <true. laughs> Here's Mike Tyson, didn't have a mother or a father. Mm -hmm. And regrettably had Don King maybe wreaking havoc and being opportunistic. Mm -hmm. And the list runs long. You know, how could Michael Vick become the poster boy for dog fighting? Right. It is almost as if he invented dog fighting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you're going to throw the book at him like, wow, well, did dog fighting end after sending him to prison and finding him guilty and trying to throw the book at him. That's what makes me frightened about the situation in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Acting like all of a sudden they know what uh, hate crimes are. Okay. You know, I mean, I think those young people did something that was heinous, mm -hmm. criminal. That was an assault. But the same people who are hesitant about dealing with hate crimes against people of color. Right. Then some part of their group start attacking Black Lives Matter. Mm. And we have to be careful that we don't let these folks define things. We don't let them set up parameters for things. We need to think. We're living in some dangerous time that we got a joker or a jokester that's going to be. <laughs> but see, I, I have mixed emotions about that. When you wake up, you say, my God, how could they pick the stupidest, dumbest? You know, now it's, I sound like maybe Dick Gravy a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, you how you find the dumbest white guy? I mean, I know some intelligent white people. I really do. Mm -hmm. I know quite a few intelligent white people. But they had to go out of their way to find somebody that obnoxious, that ruthless, or could it be they have such a disdain and a dislike for people of color that they would go get somebody vulgar, crude. You never heard Barry, man Barry talking about he's going to grab somebody by the whatever and then, oh my God. Bill Clinton never did anything like that. And people want to talk about, well, I need criticizing. And you're in the Christian right? <laughs> and you for <fall>, hallelujah. <laughs> Y'all got him. <laughs> you got him. And so black folks, I haven't, in fact, I haven't spoken to you. Mm -hmm. At least we, we uh, haven't spoken in this way since the election. Right. And... Um, I'm torn, but I'm not sad. The reason why I'm not sad is that <clears throat> maybe we got more of the truth to work with. Hmm. That this was bound to happen anyway, or at some point, that all of this toxic stuff that had built up within the larger community, that they could hide this stuff all these years hmm. and kind of keep it under wrap. Their true sentiments and true feelings toward black people. Now I'm not trying to suggest that everybody white is unworthy and is within that kind of mentality, but they got to roll up the sleeves and do a lot of work too. Right. You know, because they have to they hold some responsibility for electing or allowing Donald uh, to take office. Now, they can throw their hands up all they want to. We got a lot of problems. 
But again, after seeing two movies, mm -hmm. Fences, and uh, what's the other name? Figures. Hidden, Hidden Figures. Hidden Figures. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm seeing these as, as tools for learning. Tools for black people to begin to understand our history and what has happened to us. Both of these movies provide lessons, or potential lessons, to see and to understand what we've had to survive. We are survivors. To go through the, the, the what Malcolm calls the American nightmare. <laughs> and that's what this thing is. You have got to be knowledgeable to make sense of all this stuff every day they're throwing this stuff at us of what these people are doing it doesn't matter where it's coming from uh -huh. you know all I know is that I didn't elect Putin and that's okay but Putin is hooting tooting Putin two guns shooting you know now they want me to be mad at Putin now, I can't be mad at Putin well, we got the dawn <laughs> you know <coughs> And they both look a lot alike. Putin just don't have all that hair and, 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 and stuff. And I'm not sure he's as uh, goofy and as comical. But they are still from the same group in many ways. And I don't know how that's going to play out. Other than people are going to have to be honest. We still got climate change. We still got poor white people who don't have health care. Of course, the blacks don't count <laughs> With he without health care. And all of these changes ain't going to... And I never wanted Obama to run in the first place because I knew the country was not ready. But they really think with a straight face they can blame Obama for the problems of America. I mean, this is absurd. The white working class has been in trouble way back in the late 50s and 60s. There were people who knew that, that all of these crises would be coming up. And when you introduce technologies and robotics into this, if you look at the post office, you know, uh, they were bringing in robotics mm -hmm. and they were able to get rid of a lot of their workers because of this and any of those industries automobile industries the coal industry hmm. all this strip mining and all this stuff those jobs are gone these were the better paying jobs for unskilled workers principally white workers because black workers don't count. We don't give a damn about them. So all of this is gone. Drugs were brought into the black community in places like any of those cities, Detroit, Cleveland, Washington, Columbus, Cincinnati, Memphis, Los Angeles, Chicago, New York this prison system, all of this business. It's all about the same thing. It's control. Control, drugs, guns, violence. But again, these are policies. And there are people who know about this stuff much better than I do. I mean, they've written books on it. Mm -hmm. They've given us statistical data and information. You know, you've read that book called The Choice by Samuel Yeti. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, that book. Lord, uh, you did mention uh, Francis Welsing's mm -hmm. book, uh, the ISIS papers and That's so right. forth. And I was, I just showed you a book I've been uh, trekking through called The Future of Whiteness. Oh, this is a, oh, that's a powerful book, and there's so many others that that 
And when, you know, when I go to certain eateries, uh -huh. and I'm sitting up there with it, you know, <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> passing it around, and people look, they say, the future of whiteness. Whoa. <laughs> Interesting. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It gets people, and I'm just trying to see who will get angry. A couple mm -hmm. of black folks got act like that they were a little disappointed. Really? Because I think they really are hoping that someday maybe they could become white. Mm. <laughs> you know, but when they find out that white folks got to give it up, <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> that whiteness ain't going to serve them either. <laughs> right. So I hope we do have something to look forward to. I mean, that's everybody. That's these people, the so-called white people that's got to become human and look at their other brothers and sisters as human beings. Because that's all all of us are, is human beings. And somebody had better be getting serious to understand that everybody can't work for Walmart at 880 before taxes. Right. I mean, that's not a livable income. Now, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to understand. In many of these places, $50 may not even be adequate. And the median income in places like, uh, what is it, Daytona? I have a white friend down there. Mm -hmm. He says, Herb, you have not seen poor white folks before. I said, yes, I have. I saw you. He said, <laughs> he said Herb, Daytona has some white folks that are so poor they're eating out of garbage cans. He said, I think the median income is somewhere like $24,000 a year, $23,000, maybe for two people, three people, and a family. This is poverty. This is poor. And he's scared. He looks at this. He cries to be back in, in Virginia. He's there taking care of his uh, elderly mother. Mm -hmm. And he says, he thought he had a grip on how screwed up the country was. He said, until he went down there and saw these poor white people, I mean, they are out of it. They have no future. And if you go through that Rust Belt, I think we went on Amtrak from Alexandria to Chicago. You can sit on any side of the train and look at people's backyards, you know, as you riding on the train, mm -hmm. and you see houses that are unpainted, rusted out cars. I mean, you can, and these are white folks. All right. You know, you see the devastation. The industry is not there. Hope is not there. But for a long time, they've lied. The powers that be have lied and said it's all right. The standard of living has been going down since the 60s. Mm -hmm. The 60s. So it's finally hit that white folks realize they are poor too. They're not poor, they poor. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Are, they, are these new whites or? No, they're the same white folks. <laughs> but they had these illusions. Mm -hmm. And I've run into some students who thought, that uh, as an option, as an economic option, they join the military. And I'm, for all the ones that join the military, mm -hmm. I said, you know what this represents? They said, oh no, it represents, I said, now stop the patriotism lie. What this represents is a failed economy. There wasn't a job you could find nowhere. So you joined the, the military. So one guy said, well, I really didn't join it for that. I joined it for the educational benefits. <laughs> Parking billboard. <laughs> yeah. I said, well, how many patriots did you see while you were in the army? One character is in the Marines. Hmm. And he's talking about, well, we ought to go kick some. I said, no, 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 no. You're back here on disability. <laughs> you ought to let well enough do. Wow. You know, he says, well, you're right. I couldn't find a job. I said, well, you're not finding a job means that that's more about the economy than your patriotism. You're going to be killed and to kill. What is that about? Mm. We haven't really questioned that either. 
You know, the fact that we're all around the world bothering people. And we look at Memphis, Tennessee. What's the employment situation in, in Memphis? We already know. Mm -hmm. We already know there's a lot of hopelessness. Do we know devastated communities in, 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 in Memphis? Okay. Just drive through and we can see. Mm -hmm. And again, this is not rocket science. But here is, this is supposedly the wealthiest country in the world. And we've got all of this poverty. Poor people. All of the homelessness. And the lack of hope. Lack of hope. The greed. Then what do we do? Call in the boys in blue to become suddenly social workers with a gun. You know, you're going to kill somebody, unarmed people. You want to come through and order people around? Or did you used to be in the military? Or when we see you historically, what were you, the slave dri drivers and the bounty hunters? You know, you, you're a brute force. There is no dialogue. There should be hope. Now again, I, I'm visiting family, mm. and I've said to them that, you know, maybe we ought to get these two movies. And I imagine there are other movies and things that many people could recommend that we go into the community and show people these movies and alert them that if we had skills Mm -hmm. marketable skills, skills to take care of our people and address ourselves without name calling. See, I don't want to be calling, messing with LaTanya and La, you know, as Dick, as what well, was Bill Cosby, he's, he's the one. And now they, uh, they've almost tormented that poor character to death, Mr. Jello. Mm -hmm. You know, they use you up. He was America's father. The father figure. And everybody knows what all oh, that's about now. I guess he's supposed to boy for what? Hmm. For slipping drugs, slipping a, a pill, a pill well, on yeah. you. You're joking about Spanish fly. When, when you're animals. not looking, yeah. you, you may be Disco careful. biscuits, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you should, you should try to get his autograph first, mm -hmm. I guess, before you get doped up. <laughs> They knew what was going on. They was happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So somebody, someone said, "I <laughs> let the record show that it was not I. That they were, uh, how should I say, uh, participants. They were happy. Participants. They were knowing participants yeah. in uh, yeah. some sort. Well, actually, I'm gonna get the review. I thought the offenses review you gave was very powerful. I just want to get that on tape, like the summation of what you said. I think is very that people need to hear it. How you said about the family and uh, how they came out in fences? Yeah, like the, the first of all, the need for family, and by the time you get to what that depiction represents, time-wise, mm -hmm. what was the family trying to regain? Because remember, uh, fifty-two years before this particular uh, dramatization. African people had been only free, how many, if you said 20 years as a generation, right. only two generations in a, in a freedom wherein there was no family and community that was legally recognized and taken seriously. Who were the role models for, for fathers and young men? You know, what I see is a lot of condemnation People coming in, oh, this, speaking as if black men don't want families and don't need communities. We need all of that, but we don't know how to see it. And in that movie, we were looking at maybe some characters who were evolving toward maybe something that some of us may see as ideal. But we need to know what it was that disrupted all of this. And that's what I'm hopeful about. 
that in this movie you can see certain characters. Mm -hmm. uh, when you describe uh, this character named Troy, uh, he kills somebody, he spends 15 years in prison, he's a great athlete, baseball player, uh, he had hoped to be some of the people included into so-called major leagues. He was not allowed to do that, so he's got a lot of frustration. But he does play at some point with the great Satchel Paige and hit, managed to hit a home run mm -hmm. <laughs> on a pitch that he threw. So, but it's sort of like when you look at any of that, who are all these characters? Even the characters that we see every day and we are related to. <laughs> the frustration came out in that movie and we're living in uh, 2017. 2017 and a hundred years ago his mother died. In terms that character's mother died. And we're still dealing with the same situation that men are not in the homes, men are not in the communities. This sounds like working in the coal mines and in the diamond mines of South Africa. That you could be working 300 miles away from where your family is. So what, what kind of family life is that? Under apartheid. What impact did all that have on women? What it impact did it have on men? <clears throat> Work at, at migrating all over the place, being shipped around, put in prisons, put on work gangs, all in the name of capitalism and free enterprise. And see, I'm not one that's hung up about that, scared to say that we really got to examine profit motive profits over humanity. Mm -hmm. We'll do anything. We'll fight to defend a system. A system that's got to go steal somebody else's oil and kill somebody's mama to do it. And uh, just recently we've had a terrible situation of a young man from a uh, what kind of state? A protectorate. Mm -hmm. Name of Puerto Rico. It's stolen land, and their economy is ruined, and yet they're supposed to be a part of the American uh, territory, and this, that, and the other, but they can't vote. Hmm. In other words, they can't, they don't have senators. Uh, their status is not that they are a state, but America controls them. In fact, we practice uh, shooting guns off battleships. The Navy is down there target practicing hmm. and, and using all kinds of munitions. At one time they, they had tested a lot of the Puerto Rican women for birth control. Oh. We're always down there experimenting. Why don't they go to, to um, the Hamptons <laughs> <laughs> and uh, test out the latest birth control things on these Euro Mainstream women. Mm. It's just a thought. I, I really didn't mean it. Mm -hmm. if, if Jager Who was around, he'd be trying to investigate me. He said, what? <laughs> Why don't you test out <laughs> all of the, the latest inventions and pharmaceutical developments on all of these, especially rich white women. You know, don't, don't just get the Appalachian type white mm. women. They do it too. But I'm saying just spread the wealth around. Just give everybody some fame. But it's, it's you, you, you can see. Mm -hmm. We know where the alienation and the blues come from. Now if you got a musical instrument and you kind of really want to express how you feel about a lot of these contradictions. I'll change out the battery real quick. Okay, you can uh, so finish your thoughts. Yeah.
I, I don't totally know where we left off. We just, uh, but you know, as as mm -hmm. uh, we were speaking of the, the several movies, yeah, fences, and uh, hidden figures, hidden figures. Mm -hmm. um, I guess three or four days before coming to Memphis, uh, I saw this critique. Uh, that uh, Ishmael Reed mm. uh, organized on Hamilton. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> wow, uh, it inspired me and it let me know more than ever that we need to critique everything, even the good things. Right. You know, we need to have something to say about it and give a perspective because sometimes people. Uh, may not always, um, they may not always get it. Mm -hmm. And if they have a chance to share ideas with some other people, maybe they can deepen their own thought and get a different angle. See, I hadn't thought too much about Hamilton, but some people had given it some deep thought to realize that it's, uh, what did uh, Spike Lee bamboozle? Mm. You know, is that, that really needs to be looked at. Uh, having these black folks reenact slaveholders, you know, and turning it into some kind of hip hop mm -hmm. thing, and people thinking that, well, wow, isn't that good? But the take that uh, Ishmael Reed and his crew has on it is that we need to be serious and really need to examine the deep contradictions with that and, and, and to, to lay that out. Not just when somebody decides to run something a new way, uh, that there's still money to be made, but <clears throat> Should money be made on our real experiences? And if so, who, who should benefit from that? And what truth? Uh, some people were saying, well, this was good because it's going to get people to read about American history. Well, what is it that you want them to read about American history? Uh, we don't need to act like the slaveholders to be interested in reading American history, but we better read the truth. And this is not a comedy, that these were the lives of our people, and many people suffered. And we need to examine the, the suffering that took place 300 years ago, as well as the suffering that's still going on. And to really have deep insight into that. And we got enough brilliant people in a way, I think, that's doing a lot of things, I'm just hoping that we can examine these things and discuss it, mm -hmm. rather than just be entertained by it. See, now we saw the movie, some people may have thought, oh, uh, Hidden Figures, oh, that was good entertainment. I, I, I'm not so much entertained by the truth, mm -hmm. and I felt it was a real truth. I want us to know that it's a true story and we need to learn from that and bring that right on into 2017 and not let people denigrate our children because at one time the characters in uh, all of these movies, Denzel Washington in his movie, The Fences, said his father was sort of like Troy in some ways. His mm -hmm. father was a preacher right. in real life. Mm -hmm. And that he said his mother wanted him to go to college. His father said, no, you need to go down and just get yourself a job mm -hmm. <laughs> down here. Well, ironically, uh, this was the same position that my mother's father took vis-a-vis -vis his children. He thought they would be better off in that cotton patch. We are, by the way, we are out in, on Macon Road near, we're in Ross uh, Rossville, Tennessee, mm -hmm. uh, where a lot of cotton and so forth, you know, was grown. Mm -hmm. And 
Our family members have talked about it. Some of them are still angry with my grandfather because how could he not Carol, know? Carol, now we might be following up a little bit. How could he not know that oh, yeah, his children doing. wanted to go to college? Mm -hmm. He didn't see college as an advancement in those days. Mm -hmm. For the boys, he wanted them, they need to come on and work with him and uh, have some good crops, try to make a living, because he didn't see that with education you'd be able to utilize that education in mm -hmm. a white, dominated, white, racist kind of society. And there is no right and wrong about that, but some of the relatives just automatically criticize him. He was only doing what he knew and what he thought was right. Uh, that doesn't, that's not to say we should be without education. We got to be with education wherever we are, in the cotton patch, sitting on top of the bail. Right, right. Uh, under the, uh, we can be in jail. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to be struggling uh, to get education, to get enlightenment, to find the truth. And to me, it's not an either-or thing, you know. So I don't say, oh, uh, all of those who supposedly wanted educations were all right. Because I think some of the people who might have gotten educations uh, only did so that so far as be having a means to become bourgeois, mm -hmm. you know, uh, attain the ability to read and write, but to do what with the ability to read and write? Uh, if somebody wants to be a doctor, you want to be a doctor, why? To get rich and belong to the country club? Or you want to get a, to be a doctor? And I can say this since I'm 74. Che Guevara, che Guevara of the Cuban uh, liberation effort refused to be a doctor in Argentina mm -hmm. to rip the people off. He knew that they knew that people needed medicine, but you shouldn't be using medicine as a means to become a part of a super class. You know, you mm -hmm. you impoverish the poor working class people and the peasants while you live high on Sugar Hill. He didn't see that. He was very angry and Though he's from Argentina, as many of us know, he mm -hmm. joined the Cuban Revolution <laughs> mm -hmm. to try to, to find redress to the iniquities and all of this stuff, capitalism and uh, fascism, these, these brutal systems and this racism and discrimination. See, so I see all of this stuff. We can move towards something very progressive. Mm -hmm. But critiquing these movies, I thought Danzel did a good job. Mm -hmm. But see, this is still an ongoing kind of thing where everybody's got their story. My own father was, I could see my father in some of this. He, he, he wasn't uh, as playful as some of the characters were, but he's dealing with some of the same issues. Mm -hmm. My father's 13 years older than my mother. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I see that as a more positive strategy. I assume that was a strategy mm -hmm. on his part. Because if we live in this kind of society where women are raised to believe that a knight in shining armor is going to show up, well, it's not going to be the guy you know that's your same age because he don't have a pot to piss in or when to throw it out of either. Mm -hmm. In other words, everybody is poor. If a woman wants to find a man with accumulated wealth and assets, how is he going to find somebody if you're 25 years old and you're trying to find a brother that's 25 years old? He doesn't have a job either. And in these days, he has a student loan debt and all the rest of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So if you think that he can buy you a brand new Mercedes <laughs> and all of the expensive clothes, where, where is he going to get this from? What job? Mm -hmm. And where are you working? 
or are you sitting at home in the bubble bath? <laughs> you, you know, with your little dog and your little, you know, that's really a, a fairy tale. And I don't know too many uh, working class black people, truth be told, mm -hmm. that can live out that kind of fantasy and that kind of myth. That we are all working class people. And I feel we really know that. And that's why when I go and look at these movies, I'm taking all this with me. Mm -hmm. I don't just go and say, oh, I just want to be entertained. Uh, Will Smith and Danzel and all of you just float us out there with these illusions so we can become more bourgeois, ridiculously bourgeois. I think we need to face reality and, and really uh, see how to uplift all people. Uh, I'm principally a musician and as I'm looking at things, the John Cole trains of the world, mm -hmm. he said he wanted his music, he wanted his music to do good in the world. And that's what it's about. And I heard you earlier mention San Ra, mm -hmm. wherein you were saying a lot of people don't even know who that is. Mm -hmm. uh, San Ra was a, what should I call this guy? This guy was universal in the truest sense of the world, word rather. I mean, he knew the world. He was concerned about the world. He was, he was not just concerned about his three block neighborhood or something like, like that. Mm -hmm. He was aware of the, what, the galaxy, the, the universe, uh, this whole cosmic thing. And too many of us seem to want to be restrict, restricted to the asphalt jungle. All right. And we're, we're bigger than that. We're wiser than that. And we can know things. And we should. We should know about what's going on in Paris, whether it's good, bad, right or wrong, fat or skinny. Mm -hmm. We should be, we should know what's going on everywhere because we're conscious people and we're citizens of the world. You know, it could be in Accra, it could be in wherever, any part of Africa. And when we turn that television on, we need the insight and the opinions of all people especially our own people. Mm -hmm. We need them on there talking about economics. We don't just need somebody, some young white kid from Harvard and, and, and nothing against them because I could have been a young white kid. <laughs> you know, uh, but how about getting everybody's opinion uh, and taking everybody seriously? Mm -hmm. Trying to find everybody's voice. And that, to me, is what it's about. So, I mean, I have to give uh, high marks to some of these uh, recent uh, movie makers and everything to get us to bring these stories to us. Mm -hmm. This is about humanity and our human condition. You know, it's not about Ozzy Nelson. I, I don't have anything against Ozzy and Harriet Nelson, but mm -hmm. who gets to tell our story? What we about? Where are we going? Mm -hmm. So, wow! An exam is to be given. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm trying to be here. I'm trying to be humorous. Oh, that's good. We yeah. appreciate it, man. I, I just wanted to get that out there because you had dropped some gems earlier. I know we talked about it a couple of times. I just wanted people, other people, to hear about it. That's why I do the things I do. I try to amplify was go beyond a conversation with somebody that you respect and uh, admire so that other people get a, a taste because people are looking for information and from sources they can trust and for direction I mean I meet so many people as I go traveling young and old black white whatever they're looking for something and they just getting tired of being misled or, or deceived or right not being told things straight so we appreciate that right. Professor Smith I'm sure I, I appreciate request. on the serious side mm -hmm. I appreciate the opportunity because mm -hmm. some of what I was trying to say is that our people's self-esteem is important mm -hmm. not only the self-esteem of individuals mm -hmm. and fundamentally I'm wondering are we yet 
ready to take ourselves seriously? Can we take each other seriously? To know what Ron Hurd thinks, mm -hmm. to even care about it. Mm -hmm. And if I don't like him, I want to debate with Ron Hurd. If I think I got a bone to pick with him, mm -hmm. well, why don't I do some research, study, and, and, and meet him in the battlefield of thought right. and, and mm -hmm. try to be serious mm -hmm. and, and try to know what projects he's working on. Because we got great thinkers. Mm -hmm. You know, we got great thinkers, great doers, and, and, and we need to bring that to the forefront because I think this is what people who are younger than we are, they are missing. They think we can't think. Right, All right. You know, they need to know about J.A. Rogers. Mm -hmm. I mean, that you know who that is. Definitely, yeah. I mean, he blows my mind. Mm -hmm. Here's a guy working, what is he, uh, Pullman Porter? Right. And this guy uses his money, his resources, goes all over the world mm -hmm. to the various different museums of the world, mm -hmm. the libraries of the world, reading and studying. He wants to find out about the ancient black people and civilizations. Mm -hmm. You know, he didn't just go to some academy that already existed. Mm -hmm. he, he went to libraries. He went to these countries. And he wrote about this stuff. Mm. Now, what was his motivation? Mm -hmm. And why can't my motivation, of course, it's on a smaller scale. Right. But why don't I emulate that? And why don't I point out, you know the first people that we ever heard talk about J.A. Uh, uh, J. Rogers? Well, um, Nation Islam. Uh, yes. Yeah, Malcolm. You know, I mean, that, uh, mm -hmm. wow. Why mm -hmm. didn't somebody in, in an academy, in a history class, in a sociology class, why didn't they talk about J.A. Rogers? I mean, like, even with Skip Gates, he kind of like, he, on one hand, he respects J.A. Rogers, then he kind of dismisses him. Like, he was like some type of pseudo intellectual. Because he didn't go to Harvard. Right. <laughs> I mean, as impressed, like you said, on limited resources, he was able to do so much. Yeah. More so with folks with like big, giant, you know, tenure, outside uh, of all type of stuff. Outside and of dial chairs. Outside mm -hmm. of Du Bois and a few others, who did something? Who told him to do that? Uh, thank God he vetoed him and did what he had to do as a human being. And, and I don't know what you said, like, the people like Dr. Du Bois, the college of Wilson, they actually did respect J.A. Rogers. Yeah. You know, they actually did respect them. Yeah. And the scholarship. See, and, and, and so within our own so-called group, mm -hmm. can we respect each other and take each other seriously? Or uh, why do I have to say, uh, where did you get your degree from? <laughs> you, you know, I, I mean, I got to be bothering you. Mm -hmm. And by the way, what was the enrollment there? <laughs> and were you on some stipend? Right. Did right. you have a... Did you have a fellowship? <laughs> exactly. That's the language. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, what what grant did you did you have? You had to have some kind of grant. <laughs> you know, but we need to get away from that kind of stuff and look at the facts, look at the information, mm -hmm. rather than I have the green light to accept Ron Hurd. Right. I had to get permission. I had to kind of reach around and say. Who's heard of Ron Hurd and 10 people? Okay, well then he's okay. Right, right. Why do I need Mr. Hurd to be validated? Mm -hmm. Who validated the validators? That's right. You know, we got to get away from that kind of stuff and deal with taking care of our, our business, dealing with self-help. You know, I won't do anything not unless I get a grant from some endowment. <laughs> you know, that's not stopping us from telling the truth. All right, that's true. And talking to each other and respecting each other. You know, like Time Magazine approves of Ron Hurd, then I, then I hear I come. I want my picture took with him. Right. <laughs> In fact, I want to get his autograph. So, uh, I really believe we ought to get away from that. I'm preaching to the choir again. Oh, that's right. <laughs> you hear it every now and then. In fact, what are you? Are you a regular member of the choir? 
Are you a soloist in the choir? I might oh, just be a, the director. This is a, a dues paying member of the choir. I just oh, okay. <laughs> so you a little you a little lower in rank there. Right. <laughs> but a, a choir member, never nonetheless. That's right. Yes, sir. Yeah. So like I've been in, in, in fact, I am the choir. Uh, that's right. <laughs> I need to lose quite a bit of wet weight, but I am the choir. That's not wrong with that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Professor Smith, we appreciate you so much and the words of Great Duke Elton. We love you madly. Keep on producing and pushing. Right. Thank you.